um, I am here. Yeah, yeah I'm how I have you, Rick. Great. Uh, Rick, so wonderful that you want to participate here in our little conference about the, the modern Leosis and our tribute to Stan. It is wonderful that you have time for this. I know it is early in the morning for you here <laughs> on, a, on a Sunday, so I appreciate very much that, that you are on. You are you are famous risk among our uh, community and, and famous among uh, psychonauts. So, Rick is the president for Maps, and um, you have been working for this your whole lifetime, Rick. And um, I think I will give the word to you in the in the beginning, and then you can say what you want uh, about Stan, and then we can go into to a dialogue. And I would very much like to hear how this started for you, because I know it was in was it in nice seventy two that you were, you yes. wrote to 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 stand the, the the first time after you had some 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 sessions some some journeys yourself, right? Yeah, exactly right. So I will leave the word to you, and then we can go into a dialogue. Welcome to Rick. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wow, well, thank you so much for ha having me here to join you today. And, you know, I was honored to um, help in this tribute to Stan. I really enjoyed the Magic Garden movie there. That was wonderful as well. So I, I just want to share like f um, several different things that um, Stan did that I think are, are brilliant moves on his part that have also, you know, inspired me in different parts of what I do. So you know, how I started was, you know, I just grew up in a family that was very politically minded. And the way I saw it was, um, you know, refugees from uh, Russia and Poland uh, in the 1880s and the 1900s, the fleeing persecution and pogroms and coming to America, making um, a life for themselves, starting out very poor, and then eventually uh, becoming successful, the American dream. And then, uh, you know, I was born in 53, my dad's a doctor, and I was just really educated about um, the Holocaust as a big factor in our lives. I've had Israeli relatives since 1904, where my great-great-grandmother moved to Palestine. So, you know, all part of my growing up story was about the rebirth of the state of Israel and about the Holocaust, and um, and that just oriented me towards unconscious factors or or beyond rationality you know that that we see that here in america now with the QAnon phenomenon all of this that people are um more motivated and swayed by deep fears and anxieties and and it overwhelms rationality so it, it made me think about psychological factors and my family kind of gave me this gift of saying that they would make sure that I wouldn't starve and that I'd always have a place to stay. And so I felt like I could um, focus on what we call deeper threats, not just to Jewish people, but to the humanity as a whole. And, you know, so then it was compounded for me by the Cuban Missile Crisis, the war with you know, Russia, the potential of nuclear destruction. You know, kids in America these days get these um, active shooter drills. What if somebody comes into your school with a gun and tries to kill people? And we have had actually people in our phase three studies that were um, traumatized by Columbine, one of the schools where people did come in. But but when I was growing up, we had like, what to happen if the Russians dropped the bomb and we're in a nuclear war? And that was, you know, at ter very terrifying. And it just felt like humanity itself was, um, as a group, not very stable, <laughs> not very sane, mm -hmm. you know, way overdeveloped in our intellect and way underdeveloped in our emotional and spiritual capacity. And then for me, it was, again, this final confrontation with my own country doing stuff with the Vietnam War. And that's where I decided that I would be a draft resistor and I would end up going to jail if I needed to. Um, and I thought that that's what would happen. And I just didn't count for the um, incompetence of the government. <laughs> that I could not register for the draft and they would never notice and nothing ever happened to me. So, but that prepared me to realize that I was probably going to go to jail, that I would have a felony record and that I would never be able to um, get a real job 
That's what my parents said. And so I wasn't sure what I would do, but it was it changed for me once I read um, Realms of the Human Unconscious, oh, Observations yeah. Oh, yeah, from yeah. LSD Research by Stan Groff. So you got it right. That was 1972 oh, okay. when, okay. I was, when I was 18 years old and I had just gone to the guidance counselor at my college. And I said, help me with all these difficult trips. You know, what am I going to do? This seems really important. It was after the backlash against the psychedelic 60s in the U.S. And 1970 was Controlled Substances Act and everything was um, criminalized. And not only that, but we went way overboard and shut down all the research. And then at that time, when America was more at the height of its power, it was able to um, export our drug war all over the world. So not only were we able to shut down psychedelic research in the United States, but all over the world. And that was just incredible for me what a, a sense of repression that was. But I had no knowledge really of very much about the psychedelic research. I, I knew that there was a psychedelic culture. I didn't know that much about the psychedelic research. And I was learning a little bit more. And then when I went to this guide counselor at college and he said, this is a valid thing that you're doing. That was really important that he validated this inner quest with psychedelics and then handed me this book to read. And the thing about realms of the human unconscious is Stan didn't publish it till 1975. And this was 1972. So my guidance counselor had a manuscript copy of it from Stan directly. And he had Stan's address. I mean, how lucky could I have been? I mean, it was just incredible. That was meant to, that was meant to be. <laughs> I, I think it was. I think it was. And so so the first thing that for me was the brilliance of Stan's research. Yes. And so yes. reading this book was just uh, an eye opener for me. I hadn't really understood the depth of the research that had taken place and how many studies had been and how much they were trying to work on psychotherapeutic applications. It wasn't just uh, psychedelics for spirituality as it's been used for thousands of years, but it was how do we take these um, experiences and use them to actually, you know, help people, not just in their spiritual or orientation, you could say, but with anxiety, with depression, with alcoholism, with heroin addiction, with substance abuse. And reading the book was the transformative moment, I would say, of my entire life, because what I saw in Stan's book was that he was talking about the realms of the human unconscious. He talked about, as you know, these three areas, the Freudian, the, the Ronkian and the Grafian, I mean, and the, and the Jungian, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, um, but, but what he was doing was with a scientific lens, looking at um, questions that were often relegated to religion and spirituality, these mystical experiences, these transpersonal experiences. And this now became my political theory of change, that if you could help people have these experiences of connection, of unity, of how we're all one and with each other and with nature, that I felt that that experience had political implications in the sense that it would be much harder to demonize other people, to dehumanize others, to commit genocide, to be racist, to um, say, oh, we need to, you know, one of the things about the Vietnam War was, you know, we, we had to destroy the village to save it. You know, this kind of irony that, that if you knew that you were all connected, really, that that would be the hope for humanity, yes. that we would sense yes. our interconnected. But it was Stan looking at it from a scientific lens, not a religious lens necessarily. And also embodied in what he was doing was a process of psychotherapy that would help people to make the different steps towards growing. And that that was measurable, evaluate, evaluatable, and teachable to others about how to help do that. So it, it felt like a practical system. And I, I remember him um, talking about Krishnamurti, who had this, you know, this great um, sense of spirituality, but he was, um, he didn't have a system so much to help people have those kind of perceptions. So I, I felt that Stan's system of psychotherapy, which did, have these religious spiritual elements but also had elements about birth trauma elements about you know your biography that that was um 
the destination of this sort of mystical sense of connection and the method of getting there that combined made me think this is what the world needs this is what i need i can be an underground psychedelic therapist i don't need a license for that that's the solution to my problem so that was the first step with stan of just the brilliance of his um, analysis of the mind and of the unconscious and i was able to write him a letter because my guidance counselor had his address and here it is i'm a very confused 18 year old freshman co in college and Stan is MD, PhD, you know, head of research at Johns Hopkins, world's expert on psychedelics. And to my utter astonishment, Stan actually wrote me back. And I said, oh, that was, the, you know, the, the critical thing. And then he said that he was doing a workshop that summer in California at the place called the Man Ranch with Joan Halifax. And he invited me to come to this workshop. And that's where you may have heard me say this before, but I spoke to my parents and I said, you know, I want to drop out of college, I want to study LSD, and I want you to pay for it. <laughs> and, and I said, the thing I want to pay for first, uh, one of the things, this workshop with Stan Groff. And after a month or two of turmoil, um, they finally agreed to do that. And so that was this incredible, you know, lesson of love from my parents. And I then did this uh, workshop with Stan. I did the, um, it was very inspiring. Um, I did a month-long encounter group with Gasol therapy and others in the mountains of California. I did a three-week primal therapy intensive where my therapist and I traded off sitting with each other with LSD That's for a session. Years. And 18 yeah. years old? Wow. Yeah, all of this was at 18. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but I had the fundamental mistake that, that I made and that I, I see sometimes other people make. Um, which is the overemphasis on the experience and the underemphasis on the integration. Yes. yes. And so I thought, okay, the more drugs I take, the faster I'll evolve. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, okay, I'll do more, 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 more. And then, then it left me very ungrounded, unhappy with where I was. I didn't feel like I was operating in a much better way. Um, and that led me to this uh, period of uncertainty. And then I realized that I did need to focus on the integration. And that was 10 years of building things, building houses, building, getting grounded in the physical world, knowing all along I was gonna go back to school at some point and then go ahead and you know continue this education. But I had to get myself ready. So it took 10 years later in 1982, when I went back to college, to new college in Florida, then was Stan's second I would say brilliant um, invention, you could say with uh, Christina was holotropic breathwork. And so Stan had found a way to continue to teach about non-ordinary states in a technique that he said would be um, impossible for people to make illegal. And, you know, many people after the crackdown on the psychedelics, Many people, you know, there's a famous quote from Ram Dass, like, oh, after you get the message, hang up the phone. Many people went into meditation or other things and gave up psychedelics. And a bunch of gurus were like, psychedelics, you know, give them up. You know, we've got the techniques, you know, and I think um, because of the cultural pressure, a lot of people went along with that. But Stan was one of the very few that never disavowed the value of psychedelics or or the need for those um, kind of experiences that meditation was good in its own right, breathwork which he created with Christina was good in its own right, but it never replaced the potential value of psychedelics, that he always stayed true to the sense that the psychedelics, you know, had a role to play. But it was this idea of how he found this technique and developed this technique and breathing techniques are also thousands of years old. And that he was able to have these workshops at, at Esla. And the one I went to at the very first in September 82 was called the mystical quest. And so it was, you know, again about this idea but it was also something that during the um weeks we would each do two breathwork sessions and so you know and, and ironically of course um he was proven wrong that uh the french were able to make breathwork illegal and okay. the yeah the, the way they did that was that they have a law against cults and so they decided that breathwork was a cult and that therefore you couldn't do it so in that one case, you know, there was this way to make breathing illegal. But I think it was this other technique that um, 
that demonstrate such enormous sense of uh, patience and brilliance that it's very hard to catalyze your own uh, surrendering of your defenses. I mean, it's easier, you pop a pill, you still have to surrender to it, but the process is going. But in breathwork, you have to both stimulate the process and relax your defenses. And it's very difficult to do. That's where the um, the sitter is there to remind you, you know, when you're stopping to breathe or, you know, when you're just getting too deep and you sort of freeze up and stuff. So I thought it was just a brilliant technique, very, very difficult. And the way that he was able to use that as a through line through these dark days of teaching breath work, you know, and then it was later in 88 to 90 where I was part of the first formal breathwork program to certify holotropic breathwork practitioners, which was uh, two weeks, we would get together every six months for three years. So it was a very intense training for the breathwork. And so I was in the first group to be certified as the breathwork practitioners. And then... So you were among, you were among the first 30 that were starting with him? Yeah, yeah, I was oh, the very okay. first group. Yeah, and from 88 was it Was it 86 he started? You started no, with eight, eight, 88. Okay. He, he had been teaching breathwork before. You know, at 82 is when I learned breathwork from him and Christina. Um, but the formalized process of certifying breathwork practitioners began, and it attracted the people who were, of course, most yeah. interested in psychedelics, as well as yeah. breathwork. And several of those people are some of the world's uh, premier underground psychedelic therapists now. And some of them are uh, above ground therapists. And so, but anyway, so is breathwork. Now, in 1984, I went back to Esalen for another workshop. And so this is another of, I would say, Stan's brilliant things, which was the Spiritual Emergence Network. And so I took a workshop in the Spiritual Emergence Network. And that's, again, this theory of how to help people who are having emotional breakdowns, difficult kind of um, crises that have been pathologized by psychiatry. People get tranquilized, they try to reduce the symptoms, people get hospitalized. And Stan saw this, as some others did too, um, as a potential process of growth. That this breakdown was the breakdown of systems that weren't working anymore. And that if you could approach it as like a death rebirth process, which he had seen you know, thousands and thousands of times in LSD, you could actually help people emerge from this in a better, stronger place. And you don't pathologize it. They don't get tranquilized. They don't get diagnosed. They don't get medicated for the rest of their lives. And so, and actually it was after I had done this workshop in the Spiritual Emergence Network that I came home to Florida and it was only four or five days later that I was asked by a friend of mine to work with a friend of his who had taken MDMA that I provided them actually and she'd had a breakdown with memories of prior sexual assault and I talked about it in my TED talk but that was the first time that I ever did MDMA therapy for PTSD 1984 right after this training from Stan in this uh, process of uh, spiritual emergence and how to do that so if I wouldn't have had that training from Stan that practical work from Stan and Christina I might have never had the courage to say yes to this woman who was suicidal, who had no other options. Psychiatry had failed her. So I think that spiritual emergence network has sort of evolved now into the Zendo project. MAPS does psychedelic harm reduction at Burning Man at Boom Festival all over the world. We're trying to do peer support and training, but that came from Stan also. And then the final thing I'll just say of Stan's brilliance is this idea of community and the International Transpersonal Association and bringing together with Christina, he did this, the, the community, the worldwide community of scientists, of spiritual leaders, and of people that were just experimenting with psychedelics coming together to uh, have these conferences. And he had a series of these conferences all over the world. And that was also this very big inspiration for me. And now, you know, MAPS has had um, psychedelic science conferences in 2010, 2013, 2017, and it's sort of been following the model of what Stan has done. We focused more narrowly on psychedelic science, not on all sorts of aspects of transpersonal psychology, because I felt we needed this um, sort of narrow focus to build the field just of psychedelic research back. But it was the same general idea that I learned from Stan and Christina from the conferences that they've organized. And then now 
We've got the next one planning, which is June 18th to 25th, 2023. It's gonna be in Denver, Colorado. We're calling it Psychedelic Science, Psychedelic City, because Denver was the first city to decriminalize mushrooms. And we actually have a project where we are educating the Denver police in oh, what to wow. do if they wow. encounter people with difficult psychedelic experiences. So we're, wow. we're training the Denver police. We're doing a pilot study with around 40 of them. And if that works, we're gonna scale it up to 3,000 uh, first responders in the city of Denver. But again, that comes in a way from Stan, from the Spiritual Emergence Network of how to do this and the conferences as well. So we're planning for 10,000 people. So that's what I'm saying. We would like, you know, and it's gonna be the doorway to a new world which is the new world of legal prescription access to psychedelics for medical conditions. And we think that um, <clears throat> by the end of 2023, FDA will have approved MDMA for PTSD. <clears throat> we think um, a year or so later, we'll have psilocybin by other companies approved for PTSD, for, I mean, depression, treatment resistant depression, major depression, disorder. there's other things we're working on, other indications of it. So the conference will be the doorway to a new world. And it, in a way, is a tribute to Stan and to the legacy of him never giving up on psychedelics. And now, 50 plus years later, after the backlash and after the criminalization, we're seeing this renaissance. And I, I don't think it would have happened without Stan's work. And no. so that's, I guess, my tribute to Stan. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, what beautiful, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, Rick. Beautiful. 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 Uh, there, there are so many topics that I would like to, to, to uh, explore with you. One that you are often saying is that uh, what went good in the 60s and what went right with psychedelics, that was the problem, not what went wrong, right? Yeah, exactly. Can, okay. yeah. can, can you please uh, if, if, talk a little about that? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Because you know, the common narrative is, oh, people were unprepared. They had all these difficult experiences. Some people um, committed suicide. Some people went crazy and the culture reacted. And therefore, we criminalized all these things and that it was psychedelics going bad that caused the backlash. And so I, I do think that those things happened and that they did cause problems. But I think the heart of the problem psychedelics going right people having these senses of connection to everybody to nature and then challenging the status quo and in america in particular it was challenging the vietnam war and it was questioning what we're doing to the environment and what we're doing with a uh, potential war with russia and and it was this um what we're doing with civil rights in the united states and so the sense of people being inspired by their experiences. The other part of these experiences that this kind of um, <clears throat> death rebirth aspect of them and the sense of connection, it's also this sense of um, eternity, of time, transcendence of time and space. That's one of the main ways to evaluate this mystical experience. So people re-evaluated their relationship with death and once you do that and you see that death is not something that this you know horrible thing to be fearful of it's what you know is part of a natural process it's part of what makes life precious then you're not so scared anymore to get involved in um challenging the system you know you're willing to risk your life for a purpose for a higher purpose for meaning for justice um you know so that's something that is um part and parcel of this sort of spiritual experience that, that the the now becomes more important uh, uh martin luther king and then uh, president obama called it the fierce urgency of now you know that that you, yeah. you're, we're not going to wait for paradise in heaven you know we got to do it now so i think all of that contributed to social justice activism and we see the um first earth day the 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 strengthening of the environmental movement, I think, by people inspired by psychedelics and the connection to nature. But the, this whole theory was confirmed by an interview that um, John Ehrlichman, who was President Nixon's uh, domestic policy advisor that he did late in the 70s, and it, it sort of come out more recently. But what Ehrlichman said was that the Nixon White House 
and again, Nixon being elected in 68, um, that he had two major enemies. One was the civil rights movement and the other was the hippies. And he said, since he couldn't criminalize their behavior, their protests, what he could do was criminalize the drugs that they did and exaggerate the risks of those drugs and then use the drug war to arrest people and to break up their meetings and to arrest the leaders. And you look at what they tried to do to put Timothy Leary in jail and and succeeded in doing that. And they, they did, you know, so that what we see from President Nixon's domestic policy advisor is that they really did see the hippies and their political actions as a threat to the dominant status quo. So all of that makes me really believe that it was psychedelics going right that caused the backlash, not psychedelics going wrong. And in a sense, what we need to do to bring back the Renaissance is psychedelics going right again initially in scientific medical studies demonstrating that in certain conditions the benefits vastly outweigh the risks and then once you show that then people can start questioning all the other prejudices and and propaganda that they've been fed about the dangers of psychedelics so i think that we're following that track of psychedelics going right cause the backlash and psychedelics going right again in more limited ways but then building out to bring as the core of the renaissance so that was, so that uh, was uh, the the um the, uh, oh, there's a lot of echo when i'm speaking <laughs> okay um <laughs> um it was albert hoffman's idea and vision that his wonder substance should be used in modern elosis and yeah and um so can you What, what do you think about that? Because we're living in this psychedelic renaissance and you're working hard on this and we are many working in, in the underground, in the subculture, working with these substances. And as you saw in this first video, our place is a kind of way to, to, to manifest this modern elosis as we are conducting monthly ceremonies. And my background is uh, that I have been trained by one of uh, Stan's students, Jan Lumpy, who translated all his books. So I've been working with these philotropic states of consciousness and stands most of my whole life. So, so you know, and, and when I have got so so much out of this journey, I really want to bring this on to yeah, other seekers. So so what, what, what do you think? How can we best um, manifest this idea that Albert Hoffman, he has? Yeah, well, Albert was, you know, f phenomenally. We are so lucky that Albert was the one that invented LSD and that he was sort of the, the person that could handle the spirituality aspects of it, the therapeutic aspects of it, the science. And then when we think about Albert just as his life, you know, he was married for 79 years before uh, Anita died. He basically had one career his whole life at Sandoz. He lived in the same place. He was so stable, you could say, lived to 102, that it's the opposite of take drugs, your life gets destroyed, you drop out of call, you know, college like I did or whatever. And so I think that the modern elusis is um, essentially what we need. We need people to have this sense of global spirituality. And, and let me share that. Um, this was confirmed to me, this again theory of change of the need for a modern elusis by a fellow who was named uh, Robert Mueller, who was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And this is sort of the second example of somebody that I wrote to who wrote me back, you know, Stan being the first. But Robert Mueller was um, a French resistance fighter against the Nazis and later it became um, the sort of mystic at the UN and the um, Assistant Secretary General. And he wrote a book in 1983 called New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. And his theory was that the United Nations is to mediate conflicts between countries, but a lot of these conflicts are religious based and a lot of religious fundamentalisms are fighting other groups that, you know, and we had the Catholics and the Protestants and we have the Crusades and we have the Sunnis and Shiites and we have all these religious people who, who are killing each other. And so what his theory was is that we need people to deepen into the sense of global spirituality this kind of mystical sense that happened at Eleusis, that you would have this sense of this death rebirth process that it's it transcends time it, it transcends culture race you know Eleusis, you could have women and slaves could participate as well it wasn't just you know the men that we think about 
So it had that uh, democracies, the democratic kind of aspect to it. But I think that um, this kind of deep spiritual connection um, is key. And so I actually wrote to Robert Mueller and I said, yeah, I totally agree with you. And but you didn't say anything about psychedelics. And by that point, I educated him about the Good Friday experiment and others. And he wrote me back and he said, yes, I agree with you. I will help you bring back psychedelic research. I see that as key. So I would say that Albert's call for a modern elusis and Robert Mueller's call from the UN for this global spirituality, um, that that is um, what humanity needs. But, but I would add that it's very difficult to um, separate out a lot of the therapeutic problems that we have, the, the emotional problems. So it's not just um, about a spiritual connection. We need that, but we also need to refine our and work through our traumas and our the ways in which we no longer see the world as it is, but, but our fears, anxieties, our, our hurts color everything that we see. So I think that's, that's where I think, again, we get to stand more so. So it's both a spiritual anchor, but it's also a therapeutic process that we need. And the more you do this therapeutic work, the deeper your sense of spiritual connection, your, you know, so, so I think the modern elusis in the past, they didn't really separate out spirituality from therapy and healing or medicine from spirituality and shamans would be both this kind of healers, but also bringing you into the spirit world. And so I, I would just modify that sense that we do need this modern elusis, but we, we need it sort of married to this process of psychotherapy and that then people can more fully open up. And I think that these psychedelic clinics that we're talking about, so emerging out of medicine, then psychedelic clinics, <clears throat> and then these psychedelic clinics, I think, can become sites of initiation for people who don't have a medical diagnosis, but want a spiritual experience or um, personal growth experience, however they want to frame it. So that I think these will initially be, um, you know, places for individuals to have. Now, Eleusis was a group experience. And so I've got the most amazing thing to share right now is that we have had a um, senior retired official from the Drug Enforcement Administration who is now one of our main advisors and helps us with the DEA and get everybody their licenses and moves things along. His son went to Iraq and had, um, as a soldier in America, and had PTSD and found cannabis to be helpful and that changed his father's mind. But what we just had was a meeting with this former senior DEA official, and he said that the DEA is wanting to talk to us and others about creating an advisory group to advise them on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Now, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is what was used to give legal um, permission for the Native American church to use peyote and legal permission for the Uñao de Vegetal and the Santo Daime to use ayahuasca in religious rituals inside the U.S. So the DEA has just rejected a religious application from a group called Soul Quest in Florida, and they were doing ayahuasca. Now they had completely bogus religious claims. You know, they they claimed to be an offshoot of the Native American Church, and that gave them permission to use ayahuasca which is totally not true. And the offshoot of the Native American church was bogus as well. You could just send in a certain amount of dollars and you get a certificate, you're a member of this. So the DEA rejected that, but the DEA is interested in an advisory council on trying to help them figure out legitimate applications from people that do have a sincere spiritual um, practice that is centered around psychedelics. So this is the, uh, you know, a way in which we can move towards the modern elusis. You know, I think it's going to be extremely hard because if you, you know, for the DEA to really make this broad in a way, it's like drug legalization because everybody can say my own spirituality, it's centered on this and I've got a bunch of friends and we think that same. And so now we have a church of DMT or we have a church of 5-MeO DMT or we have a church. Of... But I think that that's where we need to be evolving to. And, and the DEA is at least open to instruction or advice on how to figure out which of these groups are genuine, which of these groups are 
you know, th there's been some groups, the Rastas, Rastafarians, you know, have claimed religious freedom to cover up massive drug smuggling. You know, but, you know, they, they do still have spirituality focused on cannabis. So how do you separate it out? You don't want massive drug smuggling, but if, if really they are saying cannabis is their religious sacrament, we should find a way to make that happen. So I think that over the next 15 or 20 years, we will be able to establish these centers that will be like the modern Eleusis. And they will either be built through these religious freedom kind of agreements or through these psychedelic clinics. You know, we are now early next year, we're gonna be start exploring group therapy for PTSD and veterans with MDMA. But that can expand. There's already work that's being done with group therapy, a little bit with group therapy with psilocybin for depression. And then you can, again, get group therapy for lack of spirituality or for the need for a spiritual experience. So I, I think that this idea of a modern elusis is exactly right. But I would just add that not just a spiritual frame, but a therapeutic frame. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But we found that one of the important things is that one thing is the journey itself, and the other thing is the integration phase. That it's really yeah. important not just only to have these experiences, but really to integrate them and implement them into your daily life. So this is one of our focus points. So perhaps this is also what you're talking about. One thing is the experience, the psychedelic experience, another thing is the therapeutic and the integration aspect of it. Yeah, and, and I see the Magic Garden as a tremendous example of integration because it's taking this these insights that you have and building it in the physical world and using the physical world as kind of a metaphor for these inner experiences. So for me, that was that's why I react so positively to it because I used the, the physical world to help me get grounded and to do the integration with this 10 years of building things. So I, I, I do think that this kind of um, spiritual experience and the integration is what's absolutely essential. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Rick. Um, <laughs> can can you can you uh, enlighten us on some of what what do you think is the the future perspective? How far are we in in getting these things legal? And and, and because I remember when we were on the uh, conference in Prague, you were talking yeah. about it was five to ten years out in the future. Yeah. How do how do you see that now? <laughs> well, uh, one of the things that's kind of embarrassing for me to, is to read past bulletins of the MAPS bulletin. So I, I had a, uh, a five-year plan for about 20 years. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, always, yeah. <laughs> I always thought it was five years away or 10 years away. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I would run into all these difficulties, and then it would still seem like five years away. But right now, it actually seems like um, a little bit, only a little bit more than two years away. So what we're saying is that um, we have one successful phase three study of MDMA-assisted therapy for um, post-traumatic stress disorder. We're in the um, early stages, I would say, the first third or so of the second phase three study. We're going to have the interim analysis from that, meaning the sneak peek at the data in May of 2022. By October of 22. We'll be done with the second phase three study, and if the results are anywhere near as good as the first one, which we so far think it is likely, that by the end of 2023, we'll have the approval, FDA approval. And we already have approval for compassionate use. We're going to set that up in about 10 different clinics around the United States where people can pay for it. Insurance isn't ready to cover it, but there's no control group. And we also have approval in Israel for 50 people for what they call open access. So I think that the FDA is um, open to making these substances into medicines. And the, the thing that's been so amazing, um, and, and I'll just share this on uh, Friday, you know, for those of you that are watching American politics, you know, it is so terrible what's going on between the Republicans and the Democrats. And the Republicans are realizing that they are a minority and that they're not really, um, the only way they can stay in power is by voter suppression or by the inequities that are built into our political system with the electoral college and stuff. So there, there's a massive split. And, and what has recently happened just um, last week was the Texas legislature um, in uh, passed this the worst um, anti-abortion law in America that's clearly unconstitutional, but the Supreme Court let it see. And they've also, a couple of weeks before that, passed incredibly terrible voter suppression laws. But on Friday, I had a meeting with the Texas led with some people in the Texas legislature about getting money from the state of Texas for psychedelic research. They have already 
passed $1.4 million for a study of psilocybin for PTSD at the Houston Veterans Administration. And so now we're going back to them to try to say, let's have another bill to put one another 1.4 million for an MDMA arm to compare with psilocybin. So in Texas, which we see some of the worst things that the Republicans are doing, the worst anti-democratic, anti-women, anti-common um, sense, we've somehow or other built bipartisan support for psychedelics. And we will know by the end of October if we get another 1.4 million from the state of Texas for MDMA research. So all of that is to say that I think that this timetable that I'm giving you about when psychedelics are really gonna be legitimized, it feels like it, it might actually be correct. That wow. it's just wow. a little bit more than two years here. And also we're doing work in Europe. We're now trying to do the fundraising for the work in Europe. And you know, I'll be coming to Germany, uh, Berlin uh, next week on Tuesday where I'll arrive on, on Wednesday um, for the MIND conference, the Insight conference that's going to be in Berlin on psychedelics. It's sort of made smaller because of COVID, but uh, in person. So a lot of it will be live stream. But I think that Europe will only be one year behind. The end of 2024, assuming we raise the money, which we think that we can, we should have MDMA therapy approved in Europe. And the groups that are working with psilocybin are also working in Europe. So I think we're in a really good shape. And the other part is Ibogaine and 5-MeO. The rise of the for-profit companies has brought in so much money to this field. You know, MAPS has raised about 50 million in the last two years, but the for-profits have raised well over a billion. And they're putting it into these, uh, I think Atai is gonna work on Ibogaine, uh, Beckley SciTech is working on 5-MeO DMT, and so are other companies. So I, I think it's, um, I wouldn't say it's inevitable, but I would say that if we're smart and wise and careful uh, in the next couple of years, we'll see. So Rick, then, then the question arises in me, who get the licenses to work with these substances? Yeah, well, and then what's also happening is, you know, drug policy reform. So we have the Oregon Psilocybin Initiative, we have psychedelics decrim in, in a bunch of places, and that's moving forward as well. But as far as who gets the licenses, um, one of the things that we've realized that's been a really big failure on our part, but understandable, is that we've not been able to get very many African Americans or minorities to volunteer to be in our studies. So that we have mostly white people, very few black people, very few Hispanic people in our studies. So what we've realized is that we need to have therapists that look like the patients. If, if the patients see therapists that look like them, then they're more likely to get over their fears of of doing this work, you know, cultural fears and and others. So we have what we call a health equity program. So that, for example, we, we the, the people that will get the licenses are only people that have been trained by the sponsors. So not all therapists can get the licenses. Not all psychiatrists can get the license. They have to be trained by us and we have to supervise them as they work with their first PTSD patient. And then they're able to continue on their own and prescribe and treat people. And then we have patient bill of rights, we collect information if there's complaints. But in order to really have the therapist look like the patients, we've had to raise uh, millions of dollars and give scholarships to um, therapists of color. So we have now gone online for our therapy training program as well as in person. And we just enrolled in our fall cohort that just started a few days ago, 522 people from around the country, most in the US, to go through this 100 hour training program online. Now, it's not enough. And so I think another sort of aspect of your question is that we believe, and Stan has been a strong advocate for this, that the therapists that do psychedelic therapy should have their own psychedelic experiences. Exactly, that, that, that is my point. Because when, when you're really going to support people on their really deep journey, then they can feel if the therapist has had the experience himself because if you really are going into a powerful ego death experience and you feel like you're dying then if, if the therapist or the supporter has had this experience himself then you can really support the the the, uh, the seeker yes now exactly and so we actually have fda approval for two protocols to give mdma to therapists um the second one was a big story because um, we applied again in uh, December of 2019 for the second shorter protocol to give MDMA to therapists. 
And the FDA said, no, we're never going to give you permission for this. We're shutting it down. It's too risky. There's no benefits. It was just bogus what the FDA was saying. And then on top of that, they were saying that the, the lead therapist needs to have an MD or a PhD. In our phase three, which we've agreed and we have a written commitment from FDA, the lead therapist has to have a license to do therapy, but they don't have to have an MD, PhD. And then FDA also said that there has to be a doctor on site at every clinic, which would be a, a poison pill. It would make it way too expensive and it would knock out a lot of private practice therapists who don't have doctor on site. And for phase three, we don't have a doctor on site. We have medical screenings and a doctor on call. So we spent over a quarter million dollars on lawyers and who, who are experts in disputes with the FDA. And about two months ago, we won. So FDA said, yes, we'll give you this protocol and they forget about this MD, PhD, forget about the doctor on site. Now, the problem is that when you do it in the context of an experiment, which is the way we're doing now, it's, it's very expensive. So the hardest part of the training program to scale is the process of having therapists volunteer to receive their own MDMA experiences. The groups that are developing psilocybin are not even trying this. They don't have protocols to give psilocybin to their therapists. And they're saying, hey, they just can go to Amsterdam and get truffles or go somewhere if they really want to. But we think we need to build it in, but it should never be required. We think it should always be optional so that the therapists who are gonna get these licenses will be required to have gone through the training program by the sponsor will be required to be supervised, but the personal experience will be um, optional. And in some of my slide talks, and I haven't used this much lately, but we have uh, I would show one diploma for people that have been through our training program that's sort of you know black and white, and then they can put that there. But then there's a rainbow diploma for those that have taken the psychedelics so that their <laughs> patients can tell who's who's got what. But I, I do uh, take your point that, that it, is, it is essential that there be legal opportunities for therapists to have their own experience. And one of the ways that we used to um, persuade the FDA for the first protocol that they approved was a fellow named Ingmar Gorman, um, who was a undergraduate at college, at the same college I went to, New College, went, he's Czech also, his family's from Czech, he went to uh, Czech Republic and, and talked to the people that worked with Stan and others doing LSD in the Czech Republic and asked them to fill out surveys and questionnaires of how important their own LSD experiences were to the work that they did with LSD, the pioneering work that Stan and his uh, associates did in Prague. And the questionnaires were unanimous. I mean, this is super important. It was great for us. We need that. And we use that data then to help persuade the FDA. So yet in another way that the team that Stan worked with, and Stan didn't create this, that was the people that he was learning from, they realized that you need to give people their own um, experience. And there's one funny story, if I have just a minute or two to share yeah, about Stan, what he talked about. This is Stan talking about his first LSD experience. And so he had guided multiple people, uh, you know, supported them in their LSD experiences before they had, um, you know, before he had his own LSD experience. And he saw the death rebirth experience. And he saw this process of people thinking that they're dying. And when your ego is sort of dissolving, you can kind of confuse ego death with physical death. And part of the art of therapy is to help people realize, no, you're not physically dying. You are dying in your sense of who you are. And you're being, you could be born into something bigger, but you're not physically dying. And so Stan saw that a bunch of times. But in his own first LSD experience with the strobe lights and all of that that he describes, um, he told us this story at Esalen one time that there was the moments during that experience where he convinced himself during his first self experience that he actually was dying, that he had this um, illness when he was young, very, and he convinced himself that this had somehow or other changed his body, and that while the other people were dealing with a symbolic death rebirth crisis because he had had this illness and it had changed his reaction to things, he actually was dying now during this LSD experience. And it took him a while to work through that fears and to realize it was symbolic. But even Stan had this moment of, oh my God, I'm actually dying. And I, you know, when, when he shared that story, we were like, God, what a relief, you know, even Stan, Stan's human, you know, he, he has these same kind of fears and anxieties all the rest of us do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Wow. Thank you for sharing all this, Rick. We are running out of time, but it has really okay. been a pleasure to have you here. If we somehow yeah. can support you and help you, then please let us know. And if you're looking for someone yeah. who had 300 plus sessions, then you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, can... <laughs> we are starting, uh, you know, as we're coming to Europe and we're starting what we call Team Psychedelics. So, um, you know, and we're looking for monthly donors, $5 a month, whatever. So if people could go to the MAPS website. That's the way to help us is build our base. And also, if you happen to know a few billionaires. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Donate, yeah. We are doing exactly the same. But Rick, we could, we could continue for hours. I appreciate so much all what you're doing yeah. and that you're participating in this. Pleasure. Love your work and love what you're doing. So, yeah. Yes. Thank you for and this I time. See. We'll stay in touch. My pleasure. And I see yeah. Susan uh, and I, look, yeah. I welcome her so, to, to what you're uh, sharing as well today. Yeah. Thank you. Yay.